All right, welcome to Reaching Out. This is our YouTube channel and platform in conjunction to our podcast at Outer Reach Lifestyles. Thank you for joining us to everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We have a very, very special guest. He is the man, Dan. He has a story for us to share, and we're excited to have him in our channel as our, as our very first guest. Uh, so I want to thank you, Dan, for coming in and joining us today. Uh, thank you, Renzo and Mel. I appreciate the opportunity to share my journey on your platform. Thank you. Thank you. So right here, uh, we are going to get to know you a little bit. You're going to tell us your story. And for you guys uh, listening to Dan's story for the first time, it, it is quite the story. He's going to go from his favorite dish to what he has uh, done in the military and what he's overcome and just the most most recently. So let's go ahead and get started without wasting any more time. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Dan, again, thank you for taking time out of your busy life and uh, joining us here at Reaching Out. Absolutely, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you very much. No problem. Okay, so right, let's get right into it. So tell us. Dan, uh, where did you grow up in? I grew up in the uh, suburbs of Philadelphia. The the rough the rough streets of Philly. As no, they outside say, right? the suburbs, yeah. But, oh, yeah. outside the suburbs. Okay, okay. Let, let's just let's just say let's just say. <laughs> so, uh, tell us tell us about Philly for people that are not familiar with the uh, with the Philadelphia area. What can you well, tell us about? I mean, you've got the it's the home of. Uh, if you want to go with the food, it's the home of the uh, Philly cheesesteak and the hoagies. My, one of my uh, favorite chains. Soft pretzels. Mm -hmm. It's at the home of the Independence Hall, the Liberty Bell, Betsy Ross's house. Valley Forge isn't too far away. I mean, that's where the history of the nation pretty much started. So uh, pretty uh, pretty amazing uh, place to, uh, to grow up and learn a lot of uh, the history of the country. Very yeah, that's true. That's a lot of history right there. Uh, and of course, this has nothing to do with history. But I, you and I, before the show, we we talked, and I think we shared one thing in common. And I, I have to bring it out because I think this is really cool. The Rocky series. I'm a fan. I know that you're a fan. And yeah. uh, have you done the 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 running up the stairs yet? No, no, I I'm, I haven't been back to Philly. Um, for when that movie came out, what in seventy, what six, I think it was, or after I that. So mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, actually it was later than that, I think. But anyway, now I haven't had that chance. But when I do get the opportunity to go to Philly to go visit uh, my relatives, uh, I would definitely. That's on my list. If I have a bucket list, that's definitely on the list. Uh, um, I don't know about the running part, but I will definitely uh, work my way up those stairs, and I will. Uh, you know, I have to put on a gray hoodie and uh, do that little the, Rocky the, the thing. Hand. That Rocky, right. Yeah, here you go. The Eye of the Tiger, the Eye of the Tiger. Eye of the Tiger, yeah. Exactly. Oh, man, it's such a, it's a classic. I'm a big fan of the movies, and that's that's my love for Philly is from that, and of course. And it's a great Philly. story. It it's, a, it's a great story. I mean, you know, Sylvester Stallone did a great job with that. I mean, that was his, that was his story. And, um, you know, we talked about him. Um, he said if... In order for that movie to be made, he's going to play the part of Rocky Balboa, and you know, we're, yeah, we're, you know, the, the rest is history. Pretty much, the the rest is history. And I mean, like I said, yeah. uh, you and I, we we talked about it. We we enjoyed the movie. It has a, a lot of things you can take from it, it as, from a sports perspective, and also. But this is important. Not every movie does this. Not every athletic movie does this. But from a personal perspective, mm. I mean, the the struggles to get to where he was. And to maintain that and when he lost it what did he do and then to get back into the top you know so exactly. and, and i said and i and the reason why i'm bringing this whole rocky thing besides being fans is because your life is very similar to that you you know you had your ups and your downs and when you found something out that brought you down you punched it right in the face and are in the rice again and now you're back to uh sharing your story that's what you're in our platform and, and you've been in many other platforms and you're continuing you're going to continue to be in other platforms after after this one so which is which is kind of like rocky-ish you know yeah. no no pun intended but it is yeah. kind of rocky-ish and and yeah. i that's that's the one thing that I, I interests me in your story and and inspires me uh, from from what we talked about but 
let's let's move on or else we're going to stay and talk about rocky all night long and i think uh there's yeah, more yeah. impressing things that uh the, the, uh, the fans want to hear the people that are listening want to hear all right so yeah so you grew up in in philly then you you you, you moved around and then this is where the cross, but the first part of your crossroads came, which is right. okay. I graduate high school. What do I do? And you decided to do what? Well, two years out of high school, I um I wanted to um I, I joined the navy because my 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 desire was to travel, not just in the U.S. but to travel, you know, uh, abroad, and I. You know, growing up in Philly, you know, a lot of history, a lot of military history. Um, so that had a lot to do with uh, my um, desire to join the Navy specifically. Um, I like the water. I like the open water and uh, the ocean salt water specifically. So I figured, well, if I join the Navy, I'll have an opportunity to learn a great skill set and travel, you know, uh, be near the water, be on the water. So it all it all worked out nicely. Um, I didn't plan everything right away. It just everything it, it evolved as my uh, as my years in the military and the navy. Uh, you know, my experience it evolved as time went on. No, I, I bet. Like just like uh, like as you said, just because we make a decision to start or do something new doesn't mean we know what the roadmap's going to be like once we get into that position, right? Into that particular uh, task so okay so now you're in the navy you survived boot camp uh, what was the, what happened right after boot camp tell, let us t tell us right there well i had i had um, gone to a, a communication school I was, back then it was what we called a radio man so i had uh, two different uh, schools uh, before i went to my first ship and then um you know, during my career, I served on board seven different ships. And of those seven ships, three of them had deployed to the Persian Gulf, one in uh, 93, then 95, and then 2001. So had a lot of exposure uh, to, uh, you know, lots of ports in, um, in foreign countries. And it was very interesting, exciting to learn the customs and cultures and courtesies and once again enjoy the wonderful food from the different ports we pulled into awesome and i so, think you, you said you mentioned to me one that what you you were one of the very few lucky people that taste the original yes ladies and gentlemen the original swar shawarma and that's yeah, and, uh, yeah. what is the oh I, I know there's a there's a bit of a controversy how do you pronounce this word some people say shawarma shawarma so what is how do you pronounce shawarma. it Shwarma. I pronounce it shawarma, but you know you can pronounce it any way you want. Any way you want, just don't call me late to dinner. Yeah, there you go. There you go. That's always that's that's the number one rule. That's right. All right. Yeah. So you travel the world with the with the navy. You got to not only serve your country, which we want to thank you for your service for everything you've done, and of course you got the thank opportunity you. to learn different uh, cultures, eat different types of food. But in in that journey of you in your military journey you've also experienced the beautiful thing which is like you mentioned the culture and the food but you also experienced the other side of that coin which is the conflicts and you had the opportunity right. to i think be through three different conflicts with the most recent one being uh with what happened the 9 11 and we'll get to that as well but tell us uh, what was your first deployment like I believe it was in well, 92. The, yeah, well, the first deployment to the Persian Gulf was in 92. And that was on board of a, a fast frigate. And we were part of the USS Kitty Hawk Battle Group. And we pulled into our ship, the USS Jared, pulled into every port that a U.S. ship was authorized to pull into in the Persian Gulf. So Kuwait, Bahrain, uh, Doha, uh, Doha in uh in Qatar, uh, we pulled into Abu Dhabi and Jebel Ali in the United Arab Emirates. So those were the ports we pulled into. Um, but uh, yeah, it was a very, 
And that was my first opportunity. In fact, a lot of us on the ship, that was the first opportunity being in the Persian Gulf. But we did a lot of workups. They prepared us mentally for this. Um, it's very trying over there because you never know what to expect because of just the, the region that you're in. And of there's course. only one way in and one way out of the Persian Gulf. And, you know, um, it's, you know, our mission over there is to keep the sea lanes open, specifically the Straits of Hormuz. And that's where the tankers, the oil tankers would come and go from the Persian Gulf. And we were there to make sure the sea lanes stay open. But our mission, our, our responsibility was to be ever vigilant on the ship because you never know what would happen. You had to plan for the worst and hope for the best. So there was a lot right. of nights that I slept with one eye open because you just don't know, you know, you have to be ready. No, I agree. I, and that, that is, that is, I can relate to that, but I can, I can only imagine how, how that could be, you know, just how intense every night was, was for you in that first experience. Right. And let's yeah. fast forward, let's fast forward to, something I think a lot more people can relate to. Uh, and that is 9-11, yeah. 2001. I was in, I personally was in school and I remember they, they told us, no, you, nobody can get out. You don't, don't, pa everybody was a panic. We didn't get home till late that day. Um, we were oblivious to what was happening. We were younger at that time, but in your, from your perspective, from your point of view, tell us, what happened? Like, what did you, what, what were you doing? Who called you? And did you deploy right away? Or what was the process like for you? Well, um, I had just completed my third deployment on my ship in August of 2001. I was, had, I was home in Hawaii and I already had an assignment to go back to the middle of the Persian Gulf. I had to go back to Bahrain the end of September of 2001. And when 9-11 happened, you know, we got a phone call from family back east. You know, Hawaii, we're five hours behind the East Coast time. And we got a call and they said, hey, you, you, you see what's going on? And I go, well, what, what's going on? We just woke up and turned the TV on. We turned it on. And, and then shortly after that, I get a phone call from the uh, Navy base in Pearl Harbor that they needed to talk to me because they we needed to make – they needed to make arrangements for me to get back to the Middle East. And so anyway, I went down to talk to them in person. And, and I mean, right away, as soon as I got the phone call from the family member back East and we turned the TV on, I went into battle mode because I knew I was going back to the Middle East. So I automatically was, my mind was already running through drills that we had been through the years. And when ships get underway, we do a lot of different drills for emergency reasons preparing us you know it's all about preventive measures so i was my mind was already going in that direction and so i uh, you know mentally i was i was ready to let's just get me on that plane let me get back to the middle east so we can so when um uh, you know when i can get you know get my new assignment over there and you know let's uh let's take care of uh business yeah i uh yeah like i said I remember vividly some of the some of the things that happened, but I'm sure from your point of view, it's like go 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 go. Mm. As soon as you heard the news, and and you were already like you said, you were already going over there. So, how was your experience uh, in the Middle East at that time? Well, I mean, uh, you know, we get back into uh, the mindset that I had, or the the way I was on the ships and deployed to the Persian Gulf. You know, sleep with one eye open. I mean, I was on the ground. However, um, you know, we just, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. And um, my background is communications and working at the communication station. And we were providing support, communication support for all the troops and military, I should say, not just U.S., but our allies in the air, at sea and on the ground and all the different countries they were supporting. So we had a huge mission over there and it was constantly uh you know, there's a lot of things going on, you know, a lot. I mean, just, you know, um, day, hour to hour, things were changing. Um, it wasn't uncommon to uh, within, even within minutes, things would change. But you just had mm. to be, once again, you had to be ever vigilant. You just had to be uh, ready to, you know, adapt, improvise and overcome as, you know, uh, and plan for the worst and hope for the best. 
No, I, I like I said, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. You always have to be ready, ready to adjust at a moment's notice. So yeah. let's go ahead and uh, so let's fast forward a little bit on that. So you survived that because you're here with us today, and and that was a, quite the experience. Like I know that it's not every day that people are going to get to um, experience something like that. Um, so okay, so we fin you finish your military career, and where did you have your final like ceremony? Can you share that with us? Oh, yeah. Um, in, in Bahrain, one of my last things that I did over there before I flew out to go back to Hawaii, I had my retirement ceremony on the base there in Bahrain. And I just I just thought it would be really cool to have it there. And it was a great opportunity to do that. And it, what an honor it was to actually, you know, have a ceremony, a retirement ceremony, you know, on foreign soil, especially – during um, Operation Iraqi Freedom, it was just a, it's it was a, one of the top highlights of my career, you know for sure. But um, yeah, it was uh, something I'll always remember. That's very cool. So now we're going into the first crossroads with you when you decided to go into the military, and then you had your your career there, and then we come to the second crossroads of your life. You're, you're back into the civilian, you have to adjust to civilian life, which I'm sure wasn't easy for you, but you, you managed that and you did that. And take us now to the point where you're diagnosed with cancer and what, and what happened then? Well, I go through annual physicals with the veterans healthcare system and we'd always discussed when I turned 50, it's, it's highly recommended to have a colonoscopy. And I was, I'd always heard that growing, you know, through the years. And I said, yeah, that's fine. Let's, when I turn 50, let's schedule it. So we scheduled it. And the concern was from the physical, the previous year, I had a 14 pound unexpected weight loss. So my GI doctor at the VA, he suggested that we, that he does an upper GI as low as a lower GI. So I, you know, absolutely. Let's do it. Now, I was sedated for these procedures. So when I woke up, my GI doctor was standing there in the recovery room and said, Daniel, we're going to need to talk. And I, I asked, what's, what's going on? And he said, well, I found a uh, hundred polyps embedded throughout your colon, rectum, and anus. And I feel that you have a condition that's going to require further evaluation and, and eventually surgery. And I want you to get seen by a certified genetic counselor at Triple Army Medical Center, which is uh, the building uh, on the same campus as the veterans uh, healthcare system. So I went to see the certified genetic counselor and a colorectal surgeon. They mm -hmm. discussed what they thought that I had, and it would require a germline DNA test to um, get further uh, diagnosis confirmation. In the meantime, they suggested that I read about the condition they thought that I had, the type of surgery that would be required, and then life after surgery, having an ostomy, a permanent ostomy. So they gave me some resources. Now, the results from the DNA test, would they said it was going to take about three weeks to get back. There's a molecular oncology lab in Pasadena, California, that will facilitate this test. And it took six weeks to get the results back. The mutation they found was in my fifth chromosome. Mm -hmm. And based on that confirmation of the mutation, I was di diagnosed with attenuated familial adenomatose polyposis. That's a mouthful. So the acronym is, is. <laughs> AFAP. And I'll just stay with the AFAP. <laughs> yeah. And it's in the best practice of medicine to have my colon, rectum, and anus removed and have a permanent ostomy because any of those polyps left unattended have a 100% chance of developing a colon cancer. So I had already read about the mutation, read about the type of surgery, and read about life after surgery being having an ostomy. I said, let's do it. Let's have the surgery. I don't want to take any chances. So two weeks later, I had the surgery, and I adapted at that point to have an anostomy. I'd read about it, and now I have it. And I learned how to uh, take care of myself. I had an incredible medical team there at Tripler and the VA 
to oversee everything. And, um, you know, I took, uh, I took it one step at a time, literally to, um, do what I needed to do to carry on with my life with this mutation and having a permanent ostomy. And I reached, I reached out to various organizations and individuals in the community and in medical profession and to share my journey, you know, to be a source of inspiration and encouragement. And, you know, also I'm trying to learn about this mutation. I have been diagnosed AFAP because uh, over time I've realized there wasn't that much information about it. Now, AFAP was discovered by Dr. Henry T. Lynch. He's the founding father of hereditary cancer research. At the time, he was, among other things, the director of preventive medicine at Creighton University, Omaha, Nebraska. And when I got diagnosed, he was 86 years old. My genetic counselor and colorectal surgeon were colleagues of Dr. Lynch. So seven months after my surgery, Dr. Lynch was coming, came to Hawaii to to do some academic lectures. And I got to be introduced to Dr. Lynch in person, I mean, in private with by my genetic counsel. We sat down after a lecture and uh, for an hour and 50 minutes, I got to talk to Dr. Lynch and he read some of my medical reports and mentioned that I had a unique case of AFAP. And through the years, we kept in contact. I'll need surveillance of my stomach and small intestine because of the mutation will manifest and has manifested in other organs. So part of the preventive measures are to have these endoscopic procedures. So when I had them, I've had those over the years, I would send Dr. Lynch the pathology report and he'd give me his feedback and insight. Then there were articles and blogs that I had written for various organizations that I would send him my draft so he can give me his feedback and insight. So once again, I'm learning, I'm still continuing to learn um, as much as I can about the mutation and, and resources out there, not just nationally, but internationally. So um, I embraced it from the onset and that just drives me even more to, uh, in fact, that's how one of the reasons I ended up uh, being introduced to uh, you and your colleague Mel on your platform here, because you know, the, through my resources, there's um, opportunities to share, you know, my journey, and that's you know, uh, and I'm I'm very appreciative of the opportunity to be on your platform, you know, share my journey. But it's no, it's we, a we thank you. Yeah, we thank you. We thank you for for like sharing. I know sometimes uh, I, we talked about this before, but um, it's not easy to share a journey because sometimes it's personal and. And you've done an amazing job, as you mentioned, sharing your story, not just with us, but with different platforms. And not just when I mean platforms, guys, I'm not just talking of dance and showing up uh, uh, podcasts and blogs. I mean, he's, he's this guy has gone places with his with his story. I mean, not just in the U.S. He's gone to other different countries and he's going to continue to go to different places, locations to share the story. And I, I think that's amazing in itself. And. I know we didn't talk about this uh, earlier, but you were quite the shy person uh, that that would barely talk to anybody. Uh, and fast forward to now, life happened, of course, and now look at you talking to masses of people and reaching out to them in various of ways, which is reading platforms to blogs, uh, podcasts through audio or YouTube channels. Uh, like us and many others that you've been to or go and going to be into. So that's, that's in itself in, in inspirational because I know it's not easy to just go ahead and open up, especially for someone who was shy about talking to people. Yeah. Well, Man. just, you know, my military experience equipped me. And once uh, I had my diagnosis and I realized that uh, I wanted to, to learn as much as I could about the mutation and my life, you know, moving forward with it. And it'll you know, be, a, you know, like I said, be a source of inspiration and encouragement. I mean, the, the more positive vibes I sent out, I was getting it back tenfold. And I want to do as much as I can to continue the legacy of Dr. Lynch, you know, and the importance of early detection and in hopes of saving lives. And that's just a, you know, it's a, it's an international mission that I'm on. You know, we can do it all virtually now. So how cool that is. 
That's, that is amazing. That's, that's what I was trying to say, that you're all over the place now. You're in different countries, which is really cool. And I, I think that's an awesome yeah. thing that you're doing and that you're sharing. And, and I know Mel and I are super excited that, you're, that you decided to join us. And, uh, mm-hmm. and record this with us because I think your story is worth sharing and, and it's worth listening to uh, because it, whatever, if somebody's going through something in life, uh, sometimes when you see other people overcome, it inspires you. It gives you ideas on how, to, how you as a person can overcome something like that or how you can at least borrow something. And, 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 and speaking about borrowing something, Dan, you have acronyms. I, I cannot let you not go and not share your acronyms you gotta share your acronyms i think they're really cool i really like them can you share your two acronyms with us before we head out yeah absolutely i have uh, created an acronym for the word adapt because i had to uh, my life i had adapted to be in a to have an ostomy a permanent ostomy so adapt to me is attitude determines the ability for a positive transformation so i you know i took my positive attitude and it was afforded me the opportunity to adapt to life being an ostomy, having an ostomy. And my other, um, there's another acronym I use. It's actually my mantra for the acronym AFAP, and that's always forge ahead with a purpose. And like that, that was actually an epiphany because in, in um, about a year and a half after my diagnosis, I woke up in the middle of the night, and the first two words on my mind were forge ahead, so I quickly turned the light on, grabbed my notepad, and wrote it down, forge ahead. And I said, well, that's good, forge ahead. That's F-A, forge ahead with a purpose. And I said, well, that's good. That's F-A-P. However, I've got the attenuated version of F-A-P. So what's that other A? And I go, well, what am I doing? I'm always, oh, always forge ahead with a purpose. So there you go. That's my mantra. That is, that is my favorite one. That is my favorite yeah, mantra take, that you have. I take a negative. And it turned it into a positive, you know, I mean, so, so uh, but I've, I've adapted, you know, I continue to adapt. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, you're always learning things, but as time goes on, you just, you just continue. I continue to, uh, to research, you know, I mean, in life, we have two choices. We can react or we respond. And I prefer to respond, meaning that I gather the information so I can make a logical decision. And, that's uh, that's helped me out you know, this far, and it continues to uh, give me uh, the opportunity once again to to share my journey uh, in as many platforms as possible. And you know, it's just a, it's a it's a quest. It's it will continue to go, you know, for for months and years to come. And that's and that's awesome. And I think that's and that, I think that's the best way to wrap this up because you left us with such a positive. Uh, influence and like I said I'm a big fan of your mantra Mm. Uh, and you use the same acronyms from what you were diagnosed with to to, like that's so cool I mean like to come up with that uh, you know that uh, to me when I when I see people or hear people that uh, use their negative experiences or negative news or circumstances or whatever you want to call it or however you want to frame it and picture it and you turn that around and make it into something positive where not only are you benefiting by succeeding, but you're also influent, influencing people, yeah. reaching out to people. Yeah. And that, right. to me, it's the most important thing. That's, that's what we're all about here, uh, out of reach and reaching out. Uh, this is what we do. We want to go ahead and, and do that with people. So, Dan, again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate having you here. We really, we really love having you, having, having to hear your story. And, and, um, and of course, just, just chatting with you, it's, it's, it was fun. Now, for everybody, if you want an, a, more, a more in-depth interview, it's on our podcast in a two-part interview. And you can hear Dan's a more detailed, in-depth story which I, I really recommend that you guys listen to it if you, if you want to know more about Dan and his story. So we want to thank everybody for joining us today. Please don't forget to share, comment, subscribe in our channel. At the, it's at the bottom below. And of course, you can reach, it, uh, you can reach out to us in our, in our other uh, social media links and uh, Instagram, 
Outer Reach Lifestyles, or Twitter, Outer underscore Reach. And if you want to support us in Patreon, it's Outer uh, re it's Reaching Out. And, of course, our podcast is Outer Reach Lifestyle, and we're on any and all platforms. And if you have any inquiries, uh, questions for us, or questions for Dan, you can reach to us at OuterReachLifestyle at gmail.com. I want to thank you guys for joining us. Dan, a special thank you to you for uh, taking time out of your day to join us here today. And I want you guys to remember to reach out, break limits. Much love. Bye.